It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. No one wants to experience the downside of life But as sure as the sun rises each day, we will. We will lose a loved one, a child will move out, a job may be lost, and a breakup may occur. And when that happens, we have the opportunity to either let it defeat and define us or to transform and lift us. Today's guest, Rachel Hollis, has experienced fear, grief, loss, and betrayal. She is here today to talk about how to embrace the difficult moments of life. Rachel's work has focused on changing the way women approach their fears. Her new book is Didn't See That Coming. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Joan, thank you so much for having me. So, Rachel, I have to tell you, when I was reading your book and when I was researching your work and how you've gotten to be on this journey that you're on, I really felt like I was looking in the mirror because everything that I'm doing and the work that I've built and and created is from the ashes of really traumatic experiences in my life. So I'm very excited about having you join us today because you've been able to turn your life experiences into life lessons. What put you on this path? What did you go through in life? Well, I had a pretty hard childhood. I had, um, I would say dysfunctional family, but I don't know if we were even functional at all. Parents who experienced a lot of um, of their own trauma growing up and sort of brought that then into the home with them, which happens quite often their relationship was really troubled. And then that kind of bled out into the rest of our family. So I grew up with a lot of, you know, screaming fights, holes being punched in the wall, you know, um, really a lot of fear, I guess I would say. I, I grew up as a little girl I can recognize now. And I spent most of my childhood sort of anticipating that um, something bad was about to happen. And when I was 14 years old, my older brother committed suicide and Mm -hmm. I found him. Mm -hmm. And that was um, whatever family there was, was decimated by that event. And so much of the person that I am now is truly the work of trying to come back to um, I guess there's no normal. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say normal, but trying to do the work to get healthy and become whole again after having gone through so much of that. Rachel, two years before I was born, my 14 year old brother passed away. So I understand what that does Mm -hmm. to the dynamics of a family. And then I grew Mm -hmm. up being the subservient good girl, trying to please everyone Mm -hmm. because I didn't want my family to experience any more pain. And then I created this life for myself where I was the people pleaser. And fast forward 23 years into a marriage, I lost my sense of self, who I was. And in the trying to reclaim who I was, I changed the dynamics of our relationship. My husband didn't like it. We ended up having marital issues. While that was going on, my mother and sister both died within a period of six months. And so in Mm. six months in middle age, I lost my marriage. I lost my, my mother. I lost my sister my son left for college. So I, I so understand, and, and I'm sharing this with you and with the listeners, because I understand the root of where your work evolved from, because mine was on a similar path. So you've written about all of, of these lessons that you've learned, and, and you've really made it your mission to help other people who might be experiencing something similar. Can you share with us just some of the biggies, some of the things that you've really learned that you now use as a foundation for your life? Oh my gosh, what are what are my most favorites? Um, I think that probably the the most life changing moment that I in my adult life that I've ever experienced, I wrote about in Girl Wash Your Face, which was my first nonfiction book, um, was I was at a conference 
and someone said this line that I will never forget. They said, or I guess they asked this question. They said, what if life isn't happening to you? What if life is happening for you? And if you were to believe that life is happening for you, then that has to mean that even the hard times, even the bad times, even the trauma, that there's something in it for you. And I felt like I had the answer to a question I had been asking for years because I really do approach my life and have approached my life this way for a very long time, but I didn't have the language for it. I would look back on, let's say, the loss of my brother, which was so awful, but I could see goodness in it. I could see that my empathy came from that experience. I could see um, the woman that I became because of that. And not to say that everything happens for a reason, because I hate that expression, but I do think it's possible to find meaning in everything that happens. Mm -hmm. So that was a profound experience was to really start to ask in every situation, how can this be for me? And I think that we're looking at that inside of 2020, right? Like some people will walk out of this year, will walk out of COVID and the crisis that that has brought upon us and will only see the hardship inside of this year. And yes, that's certainly true. This is the hardest year of my life, bar none. But in the hardest year of my life, I have grown closer to my kids. I've reclaimed so many things that I used to love and had stopped doing in the chaos of everyday life. I, like, I, have, I have gotten ownership back of so many pieces of me. So there was goodness in this too. I think that that is, that is my biggest, um, the biggest lens that I view my life through is how can this be for me? And that's the thing, Rachel, it's making that decision to see it through a different lens. As you said, I, I can remember when my father was dying of lung cancer, it w we were getting close to him passing away. And I, and I went to seek counsel from my parish priest. And I remember him saying to me to look for the blessings in the situation. And to be honest, I was very angry at him because I thought, are you kidding yeah. me? My father's dying and you want me to find a blessing? But what he meant was mm -hmm. what you just said, where you place your attention, it, it really determines the way you view the situation. So now when I look back at that time, those four months when my father was sick and I accompanied him to chemo and, and all of his treatments, he and I spent a lot of time together getting to know each other. I learned more about mm -hmm. him in those four months than I had in all of my years living with him. So I treasure that now. As crazy as that sounds, I treasure the time when my father was sick because we had really valuable moments together, like you just said you're having with your family. And, and that's just a choice that we make. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that it is, this is a practice that you have to put into play, right? Like most people don't, most people are not taught to view the world through this lens. But if you challenge yourself every day to be looking for those moments, to be looking for the blessing in a situation, then it teaches you to start doing it without conscious thought, which is so powerful. I mean, you know, what, 20 years ago, Oprah told us all that we needed a gratitude practice. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a little girl watching that show and starting, literally, I have journals from when I was 12, where I started doing a gratitude practice. And it is still very much a huge component of my life and work. And because I do this every single day, I'm able to live in this place where I am looking constantly for the blessing. So it's what I see. Rachel, you teach women to stop defining themselves in the light of other people. And as I told you, that's what I've done basically for my entire adult life. You believe that there are excuses that we tell ourselves to justify our behavior. What are some of these excuses that you think can govern our lives? I think one of the biggest excuses or the biggest lies that women, most women are raised to believe is that you have to please others in order to have love. Um, and I don't think that it's sort of put into those terms. That's not something anyone ever told me as a little girl. But I was absolutely raised to believe that I needed to look a certain way, act a certain way, speak a certain way in order to make everybody else around me comfortable and in order to feel like I was succeeding as a person. 
so often women are defined based on their relationship to others. So if you're a good mom for your kids, if you're a good wife for your partner, if you're a good daughter, if you're a good sister, then you're good. And you said this earlier, Joan, you know, you had this experience where you were inside of a marriage and you felt like you had sort of lost yourself, which is something that happens to so many women because you spend so much time trying to figure out what would make other people happy or what would make other people think that you are good, that you are right, that you are the way that you're meant to be, that you forget what it is that you even like or care about. And if you unpack the why behind that, if you really sort of get deep down, what it comes down to is that people pleasers believe that if they aren't pleasing, then they won't have love. And I, in a lot of my work and a lot of my personal therapy, got to this place in my life where I thought, you know what, because I am a, oh my gosh, I am a recovering people pleaser. Like I could be the queen of the people pleasers. But I got to a place where I thought, okay, Rachel, if your fear is that at at your core, even if it's subconscious, that you are not going to be loved, then you have to live your life in a way where you, you personally are so filled with love. You are so filled with love for yourself and you are so filled with love for others that it doesn't matter if they love you back. Because if you generate love, then you will always have love. If you have that within yourself, then you don't need to seek it out in negative ways from other people. So that was a huge, huge lesson for me. And one of the things I get, it's funny, my work, I'm not totally sure why, but my work tends to be very polarizing. People either love me or they hate me. And so one of the questions that I get a lot when I do interviews is people will say, you know, how do you deal with the negative feedback? How do you deal with people who don't like you? How do you deal with people who think you're too positive? How do you deal with these things? And I always think it's funny that so many journalists want to ask that question. And for the longest time, I was like, what is the deal? And then I realized it's because people want to know. They're like, no, literally tell me how to stop caring so much what the world thinks. And if you can ground yourself and if you can ground your work, in the right place, which I believe is a place of love and wanting to create and wanting to put goodness out in the world, I don't care what anyone says about the work because I am not doing the work for the accolades. I'm not doing the work for the the masses. I am doing the work because I believe that, on, honestly, um, we're, we're going real deep now, Joan, but I'll just tell you that my prayer for the last 10 years with everything I do, with the books that I write, with keynote speeches that I give, with the podcast, all of it, my prayer is always the same. God, give me just one person. Give me just one person. If one person's life is made better, if one person gets an idea, if one person feels hope, if one person changes their perspective because of something I created, then my life's work is worth it. And if that is the bar, then I'm untouchable. Then I cannot care of the opinions of strangers on the internet because they're not what I'm chasing. That's exactly how all of this started for me. And, you know, you talk about going deep. When I had that moment, when I looked in the mirror and I had no idea who was looking back at me, I truly believe that my husband would want to support me because he would want me to be happy. And that just wasn't Mm -hmm. the case in my life. And at some point I had to make the decision, do I go back to being that subservient, people-pleasing woman that he wanted me to be, or do I try to figure out what I want and what I need? And for whatever reason, I couldn't go back. I knew I would something would die within me if I went back. Mm-hmm. And so I moved forward. And I created the Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life brand simply because I didn't want another woman to feel the way I felt. I had no idea what I was doing. I, I This is the craziest thing I've ever done. But it all came from, like you're saying, that one moment where it was like, I can't go back to that. I need to figure this out. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a good communicator. I'll be a conduit of information. And, you know, I'll connect people like you with people who are looking for the types of answers you can provide. And and that's really where all of this came from. So when I tell you I understand everything you're saying, and you are so right and so on the mark with what you're saying, that I, I'm really happy you're here to be sharing this today. <laughs> 
It's like an amen <laughs> <you>. sister. <laughs> yes. Now let's get back to giving something practical. If someone says to you, because we're talking about the, you know, I just knew I had to do it and I went and did it. Let's give somebody a practical tool. Someone who's stuck, who might be seeing herself in your story or my story or, or whatever we're saying here today. How can that person take the first step to reclaiming an identity or building the type of life he or she may really want? So this is such a good question because oftentimes people read a book, listen to a podcast, watch a YouTube video, and they get inspired to make change. They get super inspired and they do all the research and they have all the ideas. And sometimes just in that space, they will talk themselves out of stepping forward because in trying to figure out what to do, they're overwhelmed with too many possibilities. Or maybe they get the possibilities and they're like, nope, I know where I'm going. This is the thing I'm going to do. And they set out on Monday morning and they try and do all the things and they feel so overwhelmed. So my best advice is that you should start with an area of tension in your life and just tackle that one thing. There's a great book, one of my favorites, I recommend it all the time, called The One Thing by Gary Keller. And it's about this idea of we have all these desires of what we want to do in our life or with our business. What's the one thing that you could do that would push you further than the other? And so if you focus on one thing, if you put all your energy into one thing, you will get insane traction than if you try to pursue 12 things at a time, which is what most people try and do. So you look for an area of tension, meaning what is something in your right now, in your day-to-day -day life that feels hard? Like, is there, man, getting the kids out the door to school, or it feels really hard to remember to pay all the bills on time, or it feels really hard to tackle this thing in my life. We'll start with that thing, start with that tension and figure out how to just make that one piece better. Because if you have something that occurs every single day that feels difficult and you find a way to work through it, you come up with a process, you navigate around it, whatever you have to do, and suddenly that tension is gone, the results and the way that frees up your mind to focus on other things is exponential. It's, it's crazy how much taking care of one daily piece of tension can affect your whole life. And once you tackle that one task, then you look for the next area of tension. And once you tackle that one, then you look for the next. And you get to a place where you feel like every single day you're really effectively showing up in the way that you want to. So I'll tell you for me, and I don't know if this will work for everybody, but for me, when I'm looking to implement a new daily practice, I give myself three weeks. So I don't know why I just, it's a good amount of time for me to really feel like that thing has stuck. So I give myself three weeks and I'm like, okay, for the next three weeks, we're going to do this one thing. And we're going to see how that makes your day, your days and your weeks feel better. And then when that three weeks is up, assuming that that thing works really well, I'm like, fantastic. We got a bomb new habit in our life. Now what's, what are we going to do for the next three weeks? And I just keep, you know, tweaking my days by sort of these tiny little inches. But the results of that are world changing, truly. The book is Didn't See That Coming. If you'd like to get more information about Rachel and her work, you can visit didn'tseethatcomingnewbook.com. And as always, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com, which stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read our digital magazine and sign up for the mailing list. Rachel, in about 30 seconds or less, very quickly, what's the takeaway? What's the takeaway? You, my takeaway is always the same. You are in control of what happens next. And if you want a better life, you're going to have to take ownership of how you make that happen. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Joan. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.